after a very inspiring general conference weekend, hearing messages of Christ, being reminded of temples and covenants, I've come here to beautiful Amsterdam to hear from five local members and discuss with them what they thought of general conference and also get to know a bit about the church in the area. Welcome back to the For All the Saints podcast. Don't know which camera to look at, but uh, we're here for our very exciting general conference roundtable and as is our goal we're visiting a different location after every conference to hear from local members their thoughts on general conference so it's very exciting to be here we had a a little trip around amsterdam yesterday and uh, saw the sites and visited the canals and this you might think we're in a church building but we've actually built this set from the ground up to recreate a church at <laughs> it's uh, we're here in the chapel because the Amsterdam studios were very expensive, but we're great to, grateful to be here. And I actually have an opening message from a special guest that hopefully some of you will recognise, and we'll show it on the screen. But one of my favourite films is The Best Two Years, and it was filmed near here. It was filmed in the Netherlands. So we have a special video message, so I'll, I'll show you all here. Well, good uh, good morning or good afternoon, whatever it is. Uh, I'm Scott Christopher, um, LDS actor who played Kyle Harrison in the best two years over there in Holland. And uh, I just am so tickled that uh, Ben Hancock gets a chance to sit and meet with some of the wonderful Dutch saints and debrief general conference. Um, my greetings to you. I had such a great time in uh, in Holland, in the land of the tulips. Um, of course, I you know I, I really I had a lot of time to play. So I went down to Delft and Rotterdam, and we stayed mostly around Harlem, but we spent a lot of time in Amsterdam as well. And I've been back a few times, and it was just such an honor to be there. And and uh, anyway, so. Good luck to you as you talk about um, some very special and sacred things and um, tote zines. <laughs> tote zines. Thank you, Scott, if you're watching. Um, is it strange as, as members in the Netherlands to kind of see that film and kind of those people coming over to make that film here? Like, was that cool for people in the Netherlands? Obviously, again, it was a long time ago, but... But the, the Netherlands is a very small country, so it, it does make you wonder why film in the Netherlands uh, about American missionaries. Yeah. But, uh, I, I like the uh, comic side of it, how they kept it lighthearted and uh, just showed some very touristy things about the Netherlands as well. Yes, it's uh, the Stroopoffels, the, the famous Stroopoffels. I had one yesterday and I couldn't believe how expensive it was. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I looked on Google Maps. It said to go to Van Wanderen. Yeah, Have you that's, heard the that? that's the wrong place. That's the right. It's okay. Oh. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry about it. And she said the bill, and I was like, "Wait, oh, oh okay." Most of the time, when snowbounds are very expensive, that's the wrong place to go. That, right. That's that's something that mostly the only touch people know. So. Right. Exactly. It's okay. Don't fall for the tourist trap. No, don't. Yeah. Get the real old guy. bubbles. So why don't we go around and introduce ourselves so that everyone knows who you are and, and uh, a little bit about you, because this isn't just about conference. It's about getting to know the amazing church members all around the world. So I don't know, maybe we could start with you, Seth, yeah, and I'll go around. Okay, so my name is Seth. I'm 21, 21 years old. I was born and raised in The Hague, which I still live right now. Um, I came back about two months ago from my mission. I served in Bulgaria, Western Europe, and I had an amazing time there. Wonderful. Um, I like playing sports. Um, yeah. What else? What else in there to talk about? How is, how are you adjusting back after your mission? Um, it's it's a big change. You go from a mission that is very structured and. You plan almost every minute of your day to coming home, doing nothing, almost. There's no school. There's no work. You're just at home trying to do the missionary things that you did before. Um, or trying to keep the habits that you developed. 
and I'm, but now I'm back working, doing things more actively, getting out of the house. So um, it's definitely a big change, but slowly I'm getting there. So that's cool. Yeah. Well, good luck to you. Thank you. <laughs> I, re I remember that way too long ago now. I feel, still feel like a newly returned missionary, but I'm not anymore. <laughs> but yeah. So my name is, is Analia, and I'm actually from Argentina. So I was uh, born and raised there. Um, and then my mom married an American when I was uh, almost 17, and then we moved to Ohio, finished high school there. And then I went to BYU, Idaho for a couple of years. And I met my uh, Dutch husband. And when we decided to get married, then we decided that I would be moving here. And I've been here, we've been here now for 17 years, um, of which we went two and a half years of those 17 years. We went back to Argentina. Uh, to let our five kids experience the culture and meet the grandparents and see where I grew up. Um, yeah, and we moved a few times around the country in between in the Netherlands. But um, yeah, we have our kids. And um, nice. Thank you for being here. Okay, so I'm Ian. Um, I'm 25 years old at the moment. Um, and I came back for my mission almost six years ago. It's a little bit longer than said. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I, yeah, I'm also born and raised in The Hague as well. Um, and while growing up in the church, I, a lot of times ask myself, I, I really wondered if God would be lucky and stuff like that. Um, and. Yeah, I'm very grateful that I have been able to receive that testimony for myself that God does love me uh, from yeah, quite a young age. I was 14 when I first really felt that and received that testimony. Uh, and that's basically the reason I am here right now still. That's amazing. Well, where did you serve your mission? Uh, Dominican Republic. Wow. How was that? It was really awesome it was really cool it it was um i'm not gonna say it was the best two years of my life because it's not like a mission is hard <laughs> but uh it was definitely the time where i got to know myself a lot better and also my savior jesus christ so and i feel like that has been like a kind of foundation truly for me to now be able to move forward in the gospel as well yeah yeah do, do you speak spanish yes can you speak spanish hola Go on, <laughs> I, I, you obviously speak Spanish as well. Then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> First, it's a lot better than mine. Uh, my name is Martin. Uh, I'm uh, in my 40s. I, I served my mission in the London South Mission and uh, had intended n never to go back to the, to the UK, but ended up marrying you know, somebody from the UK. Uh, lived in the UK from 2000 to 2013. I am born and raised in uh, Rotterdam, and we now live in Rotterdam with uh, my beautiful wife and four children. Oh, amazing. amazing. So I'm Rachel. Um, I'm actually from the UK, so like you, I'm not Dutch, but I've been here for four and a half years. So I was... Um, single in my 40s and I met my my lovely husband and moved here in my late 40s and started a whole new life which is quite an unusual thing to do. Um, I have three children, I have two grown-up daughters, um, the oldest is living in Singapore, she's 27 and then my other daughter's in the UK, she's 24 and I have a 17 year old son who lives at home with, with us and he moved, he did the move with us so that was quite a big change for him. Um, I work for myself so, and I was lucky enough working here. Um, we live in Eindhoven, which is a very international city. It's a bit of a tech hub. Um, so I've been able to carry on my business, which is great. So I help organizations develop their people at scale. So digital learning strategies, and I do some training development as well. So, um, and I, I like writing um, and I actually just had my first book published. Congratulations. Um, Self-published and it was a memoir about my late father biography 
And um, so it's really, it's his testimony and it's my testimony all in a book and his life. He was a great storyteller and I put all that in a book. So I'm I'm just in that kind of post-publishing phase of, um, you know, people are reading it now and getting that feedback. So it's really nice, but it took me four years. I started it when I came here and it was um, quite a journey. So it's a little bit about me. What a beautiful experience to be able to revisit all of your... Yeah. It was. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if there were any significant differences you found moving your life from the UK to the Netherlands because we're here and it's interesting learning about the culture. Yeah, well, that's a really big question. I mean, I think culturally it's not a big difference, but it's it's all the little things and those little things do add up. So people, I mean, I've been asked before, you know, was there a culture shock? And it's not really a shock. But when you're adjusting to life in a different country, it can feel overwhelming because all the little things that you could do at home that you can't do here, like how do I make an appointment at the doctor's or how do I make something for dinner when you don't understand things in the supermarket? So there's little things. But culturally, it's I find the Dutch really fascinating. And I think for what I would say to other people that aren't familiar with the Netherlands is there's a really rich historical culture and I'm very lucky my husband's a history teacher so when we go out on our day trips and go to museums it's like having your own personal tour guide and it fills me in on the history and apparently there are a lot of wars between the English and the Dutch and a lot of sea battles so um so yeah and when, when you understand the history then you then you can see how it plays out into the culture and the things like why the Dutch all have big windows and to certain other little characteristics so i don't know maybe that's another book for me to write yes who yeah. knows i would definitely read that <laughs> uh, i i run another podcast called the country house podcast it's about okay. architecture and history and there's so much that you see the influence from like dutch protestantism yeah exactly. influencing exactly. british architecture i really like that and you look at the architecture here and it's you know it was a big influence in the Carolian, uh, Carolian period, and, and you get, anyway, this is you can listen to the other podcast if you want to work around that. But the, there is a deep shared kind of history between the UK and the Dutch, so it's great to rivalry. Be. Even right, well, yeah. Well, <laughs> hopefully, you you've been very welcoming to me. Just so fun. <laughs> just wait and see. Yes. <laughs> After the break, then. Um, do you all, um, how far back in the in the church do your families go? Is it, you, I know I, I served my mission in Singapore. Um, oh, yeah, and so many people there are first, second generation fa member families. So I, I'd be interested to know about your family history in the church and family conversions. Any of you can go first. You can... Well, sure, I'll just jump in because this, this is it was in my book, actually. So my, my dad joined the church um in the 60s in London and he was age 16 um, and so yeah he was the first one his mother joined the church with him my mum also was a convert around the same time so there was a big kind of missionary effort going on at, at that time which was quite exciting um, so yeah I'm one of seven so yeah I was born and raised in the church oh, fantastic I'm also one of seven and my parents uh, were converted and became members when uh, recently after their marriage and um, being a young couple, uh, at some point they became the custodians of the uh, chapel as well. So my three of my four sisters were born in the church. Wow! <laughs> so, wow! Okay, that's, that's a story, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> so was there, was there like a a kind of apartment? Yeah, there was a caretaker home that now oh. said to the. I've never heard of that before. No, I've never heard of that yeah. before. That's not crazy. So uh, my dad was a caretaker for the, the church for few years and uh, so that's their um, claim to fame of being born in the church uh, and like Ian said uh, I grew up in the church but uh, when I was uh, 15 and 16 I lived in Utah for a year I went to Provo High and it was in that period that I had to learn for myself who I was what I really wanted to achieve and uh, if the gospel was a part of that now you you almost say Utah is the right place to do that, to, to figure that out or make you a little bit biased. But it was a very personal testimony as well that I gained uh, at that age. Uh, and that's made me stay strong in church uh, up to now. Brilliant. Brilliant. 
felt, like I said, I was raised in the church, uh, but my grandma from my mom's side, she was uh, the first one in her, like in my mom's side of the family that became a member of the church. Uh, and my dad is actually the only member of the church from his side of the family. Let me stop. How did, how did he, or what age did he join up? Do you know? I'm testing yeah, you. So my parents, they met in high school. Right. Uh, and that they were like, oh, I really thank you. And I really like you. And my mom, it's like from the very first moment, she was like, okay, uh, I'm going to date you, but I'm only getting married with someone that I can bury in the temple with as well. And then my dad was like, well, that can't be, you know, like <laughs> we're, the, we're like in high school. We're not talking about marriage. I'm not even thinking about marriage right now. Um, and then they uh, like had a relationship like on and off for a couple of years. And every single time it always came down to the point of like, okay, my mom saying, I want to get married in the temple and my dad singing, but I'm not going to go to church ever. So th then they break up and then be like, okay, we do miss each other. We love each other. And they get back together. And at one point, my mom was okay. It's like, this is actually the final, the final straw. Like I'm breaking it off. And then she went to uh, the U S to work there as an au pair. Um, and then my dad was like, okay, I want to know for myself if this is actually true or not. Uh, and if it's true, then uh, I want to be a part of it as well. So then my dad started investigating the church and the gospel. Um, and he ended up getting, receiving a testimony, getting baptized. Uh, and now they're still married and I am number three of five. That's all. Awesome. Right. A lot of big families as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of seven as well. So that's one of them, just by the case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so um, my, both my parents were uh, converted when they were in the youth. I don't really know how exciting the story was. <laughs> but yeah, I think my dad met uh, the church through my mom. But they are divorced now, so <laughs> we don't really go there too much. Uh, but, uh, That's yeah, cool. they were both in in a year. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. So my dad is also a convert, and he met the church through my mom. They were also in the same high school, and then she was biking onto the school grounds, and he was looking out the window, and he was like, "That's a very nice girl." Yeah. <laughs> so they started to they meet up dating, and every time he went over to their place to her place. He was like, I have such a good feeling here. It feels like home. So he was just very curious about what this feeling was that they had in their home. And he started going to church with them and started to investigate. And then became a member. And my mom left. And my dad served a mission. And then he came back and got married. And now they have four children. And I am the third. So, nice. Yeah. So would you say that's kind of indicative of a lot of members in the Netherlands, that it's generally grandparents or parents that that join the church or themselves rather than, you know, I, I'm not sure. Sh I should have looked up more of the, the history of the church in, in the Netherlands. I don't really know that much about it, but is it kind of, is that probably the time that most members were, you know, introduced the church around parents, grandparents, rather than, you know, I, I speak to someone when I visit America or someone and it goes all the way back to, oh, they knew Joseph Smith and he personally converted there. Would you, well, would you have an insight on that? I would, I'm not a history teacher, so I'm, no, 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 no. I'm not going <laughs> to profess to know it all, but I, I think there's been some influences uh, that uh, you could factor into the growth of the church here, the one being the war and after the war being uh a free country, uh, a lot of Americans and English uh, soldiers have been here, so there was that influence. Oh, okay. uh, the the Osmonds have also been there. <laughs> uh, Same so, in the UK, I yeah, think. exactly. So uh, that in in those days there was a, a lot of growth in the church for sure, uh, but now generally you see the members get yeah, converted to the to the gospel. In a much longer time span, uh, it takes it much longer because we're here in the in the Netherlands. We're very open-minded about a lot of things, but we're also very 
um, what would you call it? The, the polder fool. So we're not very um, open to following authority. And uh, so but connecting yourself to something that is very um, straight and, and um, uh, controlled is, is very difficult for the Dutch. And you see that now that it is um, uh, having an influence. Having said that, on the flip side of that, you know, people that are interested in church are more interested in the cause or what the gospel stands for and what it can do for you in your life. So that that is that is, is seeing some really positive uh, opportunities. Okay. So I'd like to add something to that. So I, when my husband, we've, had, we've been having discussions for years and years about this. So what happens is that there are certain things that are not really talked about as culturally in the Netherlands, right? So you can talk about your work and what you do and those kind of things, but you don't really go into religion or God. That's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of a weird thing. And you don't like the religion thing, just people really close, right? It's like, you know, I want to be free to believe what I want and everybody should believe what they want. So it's really like, there's a certain thing that's almost culturally like you just cannot say. Uh, and if you start talking about God now, then you'll be like, okay, weird, you know? So it's like, um, there are some challenges in the sense of missionary work right now. Um, because, so for example, when we talk about um, the, the gospel lesson, let's, you know, we, we go about, okay, we have a base of what is God, but generally Dutch don't really understand the concept of God. So, and we believe that it needs to be taken a step backward and more into the, okay, first experience, and then let's talk later about what you just experienced and what that was. So that kind of links to what you were saying too, and that kind of the cause of it and what it can become rather than the focusing on the actual religion itself and, and joining that. Is that kind of what you mean as well? Yes. Yeah, my husband tells me, because he's a teacher and he's teaching young people, and he's now seeing a generation of young people where they don't know the Bible stories. They've never heard of Noah or Abraham. Oh, that, you know, um, And I think whereas in the past, Dutch was so religious and the Protestant mindset, and then they went the other way. So like you just said, they're very free, so they don't want to be constrained by religion. It's not being taught. It's not there, and it's just literally not present in these young people's minds. They don't know what church is or religion. They just, it's completely foreign to them. And I think that's quite interesting a conundrum you've got then when, when you know, you want to share um, faith and belief. As you were saying, it makes it really difficult because they don't have a frame of reference. Um, and I noticed that quite a lot coming from the UK because, you know, we do have the Church of England. So many people don't go to church, but they still cultural cultural they yeah they still have a frame of reference for god and jesus christ and and church and bible stories and nativity and those things whereas here it's it's diminished um a little bit hopefully i yeah. haven't said anything that's no, like no. Dutch friends will not agree with but um yeah it's it's quite sad really but uh, i do think it could be helpful um because people they are have a belief they're very stuck to it and now with the younger people i'm myself i'm a little bit younger <laughs> uh, but what i see is that people are more open-minded and because they don't have a good understanding they are looking they're searching and then they are trying to understand and then when missionaries go around they're pretty recognizable then you have more opportunities to share what you believe because they don't know I right, saw so right. one side it's very hard because they don't have a basic understanding on the other side it's good because they're well and I think it was Aldo Ballard many years ago that said that the girl in the church of the Netherlands will come because of the recent generation the youth so that really makes sense uh, what you're saying yeah. yeah how do you strike that balance then uh, and I address this primarily to you because you're a newly freshly returned missionary but if you are looking to get that balance of um 
not expressly going I, I know you've got the badge saying the church's name on here but you're wanting to get to the heart of it and um you know get that across what you've both been saying um as well about you know experiencing it is there you know have you seen success stories recently of how that can work i think the biggest thing that helps me um on my mission is while teaching the gospel to others is trying to um, make it personal and not just teach the gospel in a general way, but helping people understand how the gospel applies to them in their lives. And here's things that they're familiar with. So in that case, it's, it's not something foreign. I think that is what helped me a while teaching or assisting in understanding the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's interesting being in, you know, Christianity, a huge part of Christianity is evangelism, right? That That's a, a huge aspect of the faith overall, not just uh, in denominations. And yet that evangelism kind of becomes difficult with a more secular world because it's like uh, we're, we're shifting from evangelism to just being an example you know, and, and allowing that to, and it seems to be a much more powerful way of conversion, right, is people see you and fruit of you really try to live that and they say, I want that. And that becomes even more prevalent in a world where there's a lot of mental health issues. I mean, we obviously have mental health issues. Everyone experiences them in, in the church or out, but the statistics show that people who actively live their religion and genuinely believe in it, do suffer less generally overall than people who don't do that. So, you know, I guess things like that help, right? Um, I think you're exactly right. And I think the, the church is actually really good at adapting to that uh, change as well, uh, where first we had missionaries knocking doors and teach the lessons, and then you were taken into the family of the church. Uh, now the church is a lot more open and it, uh, various topics are a lot more uh, open to discuss as well. Uh, and we're, we're becoming more and more of an outwardly um, uh, thinking and minded uh, a church. I love for General Conference, for example, I love watching the World Report just mm -hmm. to see what the church is all up to across the world. It's not just about coming to church on a Sunday, uh, do your activities, and a lot of the members are still stuck in this uh, uh, modus operandi of saying, okay, I have my calling, I have my ministering to do, and I'm, I'm busy, busy, busy with yeah. what I need to do at the church. Uh, but the church is actually allowing you to be an example to the world and being involved in uh, and, and be engaged in good causes and, and opportunities. Uh, recently, I, uh, as a leader, I uh, had the opportunity to open up our chapels uh, to from an example I saw at the World Report, uh, I decided to open up our chapels as well as warm rooms to let people from the community come into our chapel. And we noticed that it's primarily people with um, uh, mental health issues uh, and just loneliness or things like that. Just people that genuinely seek help and genuinely want to be uh, touched and be involved with good people. They, they'll be attracted to, to our chapels and uh, can see that we can do good, uh, good things. Organize some soup, have some sandwiches and play games for two hours. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it just shows people are looking for a real genuine connection. Connection, you know? yes. In, in the most connected we've ever been, um, we're also kind of the most disconnected we've ever been. You know, uh, We don't have that strength of community in our areas anymore. So the community really comes from places like the church. Um, my final question about the Netherlands before we get on to conference um, is what are some of the real strengths of the church in the Netherlands that say people watch it? We have a, a big listenership in, in America and in the Philippines and places like that. What might they not know about the church in the Netherlands? It's a big question. I'm looking at you. <laughs> I think 
Um, one of the things that I'm proud of uh, for the Dutch members is that we're quite scarcely spread. And uh, so if you go to Utah or other countries where the church has a lot of influence in the community, is very well established, it's easy to just trot along with, with the whole um, uh, living the gospel uh, idea. Here, if you remember, you have to work on your testimony because the only inf influence and interaction we get with the gospel is that of two hours at church and at home, but in your family. And the rest, you're, you're battling with opposition in every way and in in every form. Uh, so the members that are here, uh, I think, are really stalwart members and do it for a genuine love for the gospel, a love for their Savior, Jesus Christ. Not because it's uh, the thing to do or it's a, a cultural issue. Uh, it's, it's a very personal mentor for us here. That's really interesting. Yeah, I was going to, my thoughts when you asked the question was similar as the word diligent came to mind. And you're right about the distances. I mean, in the UK, we sometimes have, you know, a bit of distance to a stake centre or something. But here it's even more pronounced. And um, it took me a long time when I got here to get my head round because yeah, I have a son and he's in the youth program and you have like a seminary monthly things, monthly meetings. And um, and I was very much used to that. And I came here and I was like, why, why is it so far away? And then I found out and it took me, I just couldn't get my head around it that they don't do it at the stake every month. They join the three stakes together. So you're traveling to another stake center that's the other side of the Netherlands. So... I'm like, but that's that's like a whole day, you know, and then do like a activity in the afternoon and evening. So you are literally out the whole day. And I just it, it I couldn't get my head around it for a long time. I was like, this doesn't work, but it's because of the numbers. You know, you need a mass, so you need a critical mass of youth to make things work. And and so I'm always just really humbled by the example of all the other parents and all the other leaders that are doing those journeys regularly. And, you know, we we are a little bit dip in and dip out. Um, but yeah, there's there's members that are doing that traveling and to the temple as well. I, I work at the temple once a month and there's people that come a really long way to do, um, you know, and they have full time jobs. They're doing this. They're not retired. They're doing this at the weekend. And so there is there is a real effort. And as you said, people, you know, have that testimony. They do whatever they have to do to make it work. So, you know, it's, it's very commendable and it's very humbling. Mm -hmm. uh, any further insights on that from you guys? You think? Yeah, I feel like we, as Dutch people in general, and uh, not just members of the church, but as Dutch people, we are very direct, um, and we're always uh, very honest. Of course, there's a fine line between being direct and honest, and also being rude. And that, <laughs> I also feel like sometimes we as Dutch people very easily cross that line, um, but. Um, I feel like, especially in the church, uh, I think it was already sort of mentioned that the members are always very, uh, very honest about why why they are in the church, what they are struggling with, and also, um, yeah, I, could, I don't even not say this, but there, there's always they're always very genuine in what they do. I feel, I feel like it's beautiful. Well, that's something nice of the Dutch that, you know, my husband, my husband is Dutch and uh, I really appreciate that he will say what he is really thinking. And sometimes it's difficult that at the end of the day, I appreciate to know what, what he really thinks rather than, you know, just a nice answer um, that may not be the true. So that's really nice. So something that I have noticed, I have noticed also in other, like in Argentina while over there, but um, because I live so many years here, I seen it a lot and that is how there are certain families who are carrying a lot of the weight in um, each ward so so yeah you have few members that kind of rotate and do most of the heavy lifting so that's we we need more leaders yeah, that's something that's very important here to get more leaders and spread the weight a little bit mm -hmm. It's almost like if you're a really active member, you can expect uh, responsibility and, yes. and work. And... Yeah, I'm 38 and I've been president of every possible <laughs> and multiple times. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, definitely. 
Yeah, that's an interesting insight. Um, so on to general conference. The reason we're going to start talking about it, uh, but I do think it's it's so fascinating to have that discussion and, and helpful too. Um, so my first two questions on conference that we kind of lumped together would be: Do you have any special conference traditions? Uh, things that you do. I'll give you an example. My family used to put bowls of sweets out. I think I said this last year. I'm going to say this every six months at conference. Uh, and it would have the words, and we'd be listening out as kids for the words and uh, fill our bag and stuff. And I actually, it did help me pay a lot of attention. Um, so that was good. But uh, that, and also, if there are any, you know, standout moments for you that kind of defined uh, the conference. And uh, I don't know, it, it's helpful to go around in an order, but anyone can kind of shout at first. I can uh, I can let everybody think I see everybody thinking. Okay. So I just love how many people do like the food thing. We're kind of like boring at home. And I think because we've moved between Argentina and Ireland, we're more like, okay, let's look at the circumstance right now and what's best for our family. Um, and I just look at, okay, what, for example, I have five children. So I look at, okay, what can they handle? And like the little ones, for example, they will watch the beginning and I make sure that they know, okay, that's an apostle of God. It's the prophet of Jesus Christ, right? I make that really emphasis. But then the little ones that are four and six, I don't, like they can stay, but they can also go if they cannot handle it. Also because I want to maintain the spirit for the rest of the family. And then the older ones will watch it with us. And then we'll eat at uh, 5, 5.30 and then conference starts at 6. So we make sure... Uh, that we can eat before a conference starts. But um, since so we've been moving around, um, we've taken every every year uh, what's best for our family. I just want to really mention, though, that how blessed we are that we can just watch conference live. Because when I was a child in Argentina, like conference will be translated into Spanish and we will get a VHS. I think a couple of months later. Wow. And then we would just watch it in the ward um on a small old TV, right? To just all together. And my mom was like, Okay, you just sit there and just watch conference. And we would just, you know, sit there and watch conference, which as a child was very boring. But how amazing it is that we can just watch live right now and just at the comfort of our own homes and just with food if we want to and whatever else is needed. That's such a great thought. I, I hadn't thought of it there. I remember back in the day, my dad dragging me to the priesthood session of conference <laughs> at church and I'd be like, mm. <laughs> but I love what you said about not, uh, you don't necessarily expect your young kids to sit through it, but what you do do in view of that is really emphasize the start bit and make sure their interaction with it is a, a positive one and a productive exactly. one that they are learning from that. I think that's a beautiful thought. Thank you for sharing that. Talking about the priesthood sessions, um, we don't have them anymore. But when when we had priesthood sessions and I was in the young men, uh, something we used to do is with the young men, we would make breakfast for all the brethren that would come to church. Nice. So let's say if, um, the session started at 10, uh, if I'm correct, we would be there at maybe 8.30 as a group of young men, make eggs, bacon, bread. And then at 9 o'clock, the brother would show up. And we would all have breakfast together, and then we'd watch the session together. That's something that helped me sit through the session. That's such a great thing of serving others. So that's one tradition we had, and I wish we would bring it back. <laughs> uh, for you, were there any kind of, what was the, I don't know, were there any standout moments or highlights for you from from this conference? Um, ever... Since I ever since I got back from my mission, I've been wanting to go to the temple a lot, and um, I've been succeeding at that nice. because it's very close to where I live, to about 20, 30 minutes. Um, but I've always felt a little bit not really guilty, but I wanted to go with others as well. I usually feel like I go with my parents, and that's it. That's it, and that's good, of course, for me. But I also wish others would uh, go. So I really was am grateful that this conference was, was a lot about the temple and how important it is to go. And I hope that it will bring a change in, in people and understand that they also should go. 
of course, what their life or what their circumstances allow. But I hope I'll see some more people more. Temple was a big, big thing. Yeah, the red lines. Yes, huge thing. Covenants temple. Yeah. That someone did a, a word, um, the, count not a word, count. a word count. Yeah, and the the most mentioned words went from like God to Jesus, temple, covenants, and <laughs> the. I mean, it, was a, it was really, uh, really emphasized. Uh, any other thoughts on on traditions and and standout moments? So. Back in the days when we were young, we had to go to the chapel to watch uh, the conference, uh, and and they they would be long sits, obviously. So I was amazed when I, as a teenager, and lived in the state for a year, and we'd be listening to the conference on the radio while we're driving through the canyons. And I remember having a corn dog, and that's just a very <laughs> vivid memory that stuck with me. So I found out that Rotterdam has a shop where they sell corn dogs. And so this conference, I actually got my entire family to eat corn dogs while watching the conference. <laughs> That's just because it was uh, very melancholy for, on my part. Um, but uh, did they enjoy them? Most of them did. <laughs> I, I enjoyed them. The <laughs> but uh, no, it, it was good. We don't really have traditions, but we do emphasize the importance of you know, we know Moses, we know Abraham, we know about Joseph Smith. This is President Nelson. He's also a prophet, just like the other prophets of old. And to have that opportunity now to just watch him uh, on the telly is quite amazing. Uh, so we do uh, emphasize the enormous blessing that it is to have a prophet on this earth today, have apostles, and um, that we can view them and listen to them and read what they say to us um, so easily now so it's so readily available it's uh, quite amazing it's it's quite incredible whenever you hear uh, i don't know if you have the same experience but for me when i hear president nelson speak even when i've kind of eight hours into watching conference and i'm like really struggling to pay attention to most speakers as soon as president nelson speaks it's just you're on the edge of your seat you hang on every word he says um, he really speaks with, with power and authority of God, just like you read in Sons of Mosiah, the same. It's that same feeling um, just reaffirms that, you know, the 10th hour of conference is the one that naturally you just can't help but pay attention to, even more so than the first talk, you know, um, because of the power that he speaks with. Um, and what a brilliant talk as well. Yeah. Any other uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think for me, I mean, we don't have any particular conference traditions, but a tradition that I formed um, in the years where I was on my own and didn't have um, people around me to watch conference with. And and I also find it really hard to take it all in, all in one go. It's like a feast, it's too much. So, and I would just listen to a talk every night before I went to bed, a different one. And um, and I just really like that, just taking them one at a time. And, and like yesterday, I was biking somewhere so I put my headphones in and listened to um to a couple on you know on my phone and just for me just that private time just revisiting is you just have you can have so many like wonderful spiritual moments just on your own just you know enveloping yourself in these words and um that for me I don't know I just think I learn so much more about my own um worship from all those times where I've had that solitude and and taking in these wonderful messages. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, do, do you have anything to add, or I, I don't want to let no. you? It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, Someone else. so yeah, we don't really have any traditions. What we do do is we like sit on the couch. We actually eat our dinner while watching General Conference, nice. um, and I don't know. It just feels really good to just be there with my parents and my siblings as well, just like sitting on the couch and all being focused on the same thing as well, or being focused on general conference. Um, then this general conference, especially it, um, I found it really interesting that a lot of people talked about the joy of the gospel and that the gospel actually can bring us joy if we choose to, uh, yeah, to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I thought that was really interesting that there was like a focus on that as well, and that 
but the goal of our Heavenly Father is for all of his children to receive that joy and to come back to him, not just a few ones that he selected or the ones that he his favorite ones, but like all of us. So, yeah. Yeah, and it was it was very much that, wasn't it? It was that and like and by the way, covenants is how you do it, how you get that, you know, how you feel that. It was really interesting. Um favorite talks. I would love to hear <laughs> I know <laughs> um we haven't had much time that we're recording this, you know, midweek after but uh, if any of you did have a favourite talk, I-, I can share mine first off, which was Preston Holland's yeah, talk. Well, that yeah. was my number one. Oh, yeah. yeah, great. Well, I won't delve into it um, much, but just the power with which he spoke, yeah. um, reminding me of the importance of prayer. That was something for me. I was like, yeah, I definitely need to pray more often and take that more seriously after hearing that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we never knew there was a hedge behind it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he's so clever with his humour, isn't he? Because yeah. he, I mean, that's his trademark is the humour, but he pivoted from getting everyone relaxed and with him into sh- saying, sure. we're going to share, oh, yeah. share something really personal. And he says, you know, what happened, he talked about what happened in the hospital. He talked about losing his wife. And he talked about what happened in the hospital where he obviously had this, um, you know, he, he talked about being on the edges of eternity. And he, and he came back from that every day has to count I have to do what I have to do so he's had some amazing spiritual experience and he just just brought us into that in such a an amazing way and it obviously and it, the way he prefaced it, it obviously was very personal for him to share but he knew he had to share it so yeah it was quite mind-blowing as a talk really because actually it reminded me of exactly the previous conference when M. Russell Ballard gave his address and you knew that he was giving it, knowing it was his, going to be his last address, which it was. And I, and I got that same feeling here from Elder Holland, especially when he said, um, you know, weeks and months. And it seems like he thought that. So, well. Yeah, so this, this could, you know, from what he's saying, he, he wanted to make this one count. Um, and that, what an amazing thing. If you've got to give a message to the world, your last message, maybe, hopefully not, but then, you know, you're going to pack everything in it and, and tell people what's serious. And he used the word urgent in there. You know, this is urgent. Um, and, and he talked about giving, like being warm, but giving like an apostolic, I don't know, encouragement, but he said like a warm warning or something like that. Um, so he's still with the love, but he's saying, come on, wake up. So, yeah, it's incredibly powerful. The way he spoke to, you know, 20,000 people there, but millions worldwide. And yet he it was personal. It was yeah. so personal. Yeah. It felt like, you know, he was gathering a group of us together and saying, well, yeah. this is what matters most. And his gratitude, he talked about... Um, you know, he was so grateful when he was ill and his wife was ill for the prayers. Um, and there was a lovely quote that he he quoted someone else. And he, he said that thanks are the highest form of thought and gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. I thought, wow, that's, that's so, it's really lovely. It really, it really touched me, actually. It, it reminds me of my dad when he was, he was dying and he, um, he was very grateful for people praying for him. And I think, those of us that, you know, anyone that's been in that situation where your life's in the balance and you know people are praying for you makes so much difference. You know, don't ever underestimate the difference that it makes. Absolutely. I've got a quote from him to share. I bear Your solemn witness of the reality of eternal life and the need for us to be serious in our planning for it. That serious needs to exist when Christ comes, because he needs to recognize us, not as nominal members listed on a faded baptismal record, but as thoroughly committed, faithfully believing, covenant-keeping disciples. This is an urgent matter for all of us, lest we ever hear with devastating regret, I never knew you. Or as Joseph Smith translated that phrase, you never knew me. So, so powerful. And it seems like the members in Netherlands doing great with that. From what we've heard, 
it's not nominal members, it's everyone's really doing their part and getting stuck in for the right reasons, which is beautiful to hear. Uh, any other favorite talks? Well, for me, I have to say, my this is probably my conference tradition, actually, is to pick out the one talk. Having a teenager in the house, I always like to pick out the one talk that we're then going to show him, like the following fam family home evening, because he's a bit in and out. He doesn't sit and watch the whole marathon session. So, And I think it was like the third talk in from um, Elder Alexander Dushku, and he is called Pillars and Rays, mm. and he... he he did this wonderful account of um, Joseph Smith's first vision, but he told it in a way like we'd never heard it before. You know, he told it like in a in a just a, in a fresh way, he made it really compelling, and and he talked about the pillar of light. And he said, look, we don't all get a pillar of light; we just get rays. Um, and he said, you get a ray, and then you build on it, you get another ray, and you get stronger and stronger. And he gave some personal examples of things in his own life that were like the rays, but. It was just he was really engaging and he spoke with a real passion on such a such an important topic for anyone, our young people in particular, but anyone that is wondering what is a testimony? You know, what is a testimony? What does it look like? So I, I really liked that because having those entry level talks kind of thing for people that are new or finding their way, I, they're just so important. So I, I really appreciated his message. <laughs> So um, it's very difficult to choose uh, one, but um, I loved uh, Ugdor's talk about the higher way. I just I loved the whole way that he was able to visual visualize it with with the comparison with the plane. And um, it is true there is happiness in the world. There is there, but it's just not comparable with the happiness that comes from leaving the gospel and just having the companionship of the Holy Ghost is just such an indescribable feeling. And it's so much more profound than anything else I have experienced in the world. Um, lasting happiness, it's just, I, just, I cannot even explain it. So I just really love the way he explained it. So that's one of them. I also really liked um, Elder Bernard's talk. I feel like I need to study that one a couple of times. <laughs> and well, of course, President Nelson's talk. That I need to also study that one a couple of times because there's so much in there. I'm still studying his last talk. And yeah. Every time you read it, there's just so now, now we've got to read the footnotes as well because the, the sister from the Relief Society that spoke, she was second, yeah. she was like, dig into his footnotes. Yeah. Well, oh my gosh, it never ends. <laughs> Too much prophecy. Yeah. <laughs> I always, I always like, like you said, like choosing a favorite talk in general conference is just impossible because there's so many good talks. Um, but what I do really love is the feeling that I had after general conference. So after this weekend, when I left home Monday morning to go to work, I was on my bike, and the feeling that I had while I was like driving ready to work uh, I was like okay I am ready Jesus Christ needs to come back like I want him to come back like I was actually looking forward to that and that's like just that feeling is like okay yes this is what we're going for and this is this is the goal but yeah I just love that that's such a great insight yeah I think my favorite talk or one I liked a lot was about Kieran. Uh, he made a very good first depression. It could have been the accent, I don't know. Um, but he'd, he'd make it. Yeah, yeah, but you took me. <laughs> okay, sorry. Did you just, when I was listening, I just heard and felt how sincere he was um, about the things he was talking. And just on a topic that almost everyone can relate to. I think it was very well, it went along very well with Elder Gong's talk. Sure. How the gospel is for our good. And that there aren't any roadblocks to keep us away. But that Heavenly Father is really trying to, to get us back instead of leaving us here or pushing us away. So 
He said, my friends, my, my fellow disciples on the road of mortal life, our father's beautiful plan, even his fabulous plan, is designed to bring you home, not to keep you out. No one has built a roadblock and stationed someone there to turn you around and send you away. In fact, it's the exact opposite. God is in relentless pursuit of you. He wants all of his children to choose to return to him, and he employs every possible measure to bring you back. Um, were there any more thoughts on Elder Kieran's talk in that comment? For me, Elder Kieran, I think he's, he's a great orator. He writes great talks and delivers them well, as you said. And I, I, it's a few years ago, we delivered one called Refuge from the Storm. Yes. Um, most amazing thing ever written. And, and I just, I can't wait to see what else he does going forward because he just has a really good way with words and then he just delivers it really, really well. And that's, it just makes it so powerful. But he's so humble as well. Um, and when he got his his calling to the 12, that I don't know if you saw the video message he put out, you know, he's, He's so humble. Um, so I think it's just really exciting watching, you know, him find his feet as, as a member of the 12. But um, for me, that was another theme of the conference um, because it's the first time we've had so many speaking, remaining seated and profit not there. Of course, yeah. And obviously, you know, they're getting older. There's a group that are really pushing it and, you know, we have this wonderful succession plan that we know the plan and there's no question of who's going to move up. But for me, it, it felt quite, um, I think it might turn out to be a significant conference because it might not be many more months in time before we see not just one change, but a few changes because the, the age of these dear dear brethren so for me that felt quite sobering because even though we know they're old and we know people's people's mortal life has a has a, a limit we, we you know we feel like we know these men we've been watching them listening to them for years so when somebody passes away you know it's we, we're going to feel that collective grief so i think in the we do need to prepare ourselves because i think it might be coming you know there's well, it was strange even just not having President Ballard there, you know, yeah. that warm, comforting, but also the heritage that he brings and yeah. kind of, I missed that, that kind of. Yeah, he always presence. has a really lovely tone, didn't he? Really balanced and measured yeah. tone. And yeah, so I think, and seeing like President Eyring, um conducting, seated, yeah. you know, there was a lot of firsts. Like, yeah, there was the a lot of firsts happened in this conference i think that you kind of have to acknowledge that as well apostles conducting that was yeah kind was... Of, uh yeah but i know it's it is quite macabre to talk about but then i think before El, before elder ballard passed away it was either the longest serving or the second longest serving quorum of the 12 and first presidency without change mm. in the church which was kind of interesting to know. That's a lot of stability, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, and it looks like again, macabre to talk about, but there will probably be a significant number of of changes in that now. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see that. And I think it came up uh, in various times as well, where uh, a lot of the apostles and uh, sisters as well uh, shared personal experiences, very personal stories, to say, okay, despite our calling or where we're serving. We are a human, and we have our struggles as well. And for me, that was the, the next to the the red line of the temple of commitment and uh, dedication. Um, it was really about our life is hard, and uh, the gospel isn't going to take away those uh, problems. It's there to sustain you, to support you through uh, life's journey. And um, a lot of the apostles and speakers really personalized that, uh, which may, made me uh, a lot more understanding of their situation and their circumstances. My favorite talk, uh, next to the, uh, the one from Jeffrey R. Hollett, was 
uh, from Elder DeFeo, um, where he talked about how to come unto Christ. Uh, but for me, what he kept saying as well was uh, to act rather than to be acted upon. And I think that is, uh, for me, a personal message about, okay, how do I stand in life and what do I do to make things work uh, for, for me, for my family, and also for wanting to live the gospel. And so, uh, and again, he too started out by saying how he had something very personal to deal with uh, and uh, uh, that actually knocked him for six. So uh, that hit home for me. And I see that the theme of choosing, I saw it throughout the conference um, because, you know, you just said acting instead of being acted upon. Elder Kira also, Kieran said, God wants us to learn to choose, to choose to come back to him. And I have here a couple more. Um, Elder Cook said, um, and then I have to see what that was. Oh, to receive the blessings of the atonement, we have to choose Christ. And Paul V. Piper said, a uh, relationship with Christ can only exist when we choose to trust God. His goal is not that we will do that which is right, but that we will choose that which is right. So you see there are quite a few different talks that talked about choosing God rather than just doing whatever. It's really that yeah. choosing and being, choosing to act. Yeah. We saw the same with Elder Cook as well, right? His, um... There seems to be a lot of philosophical debate right now. I, I work in podcasts and that's a, a constant theme that people seem to be asking at the moment is, does free will actually exist? Um, and they're having all these philosophers dis discuss it and debate it with lots of technicalities. But then an apostle of the Lord stands up, as Elder Cook did, and talks about agency and the blessing that we have of agency and, and discussing it. And we have all of these things about choice and the choice to make covenants. And uh, I thought that was really profound. And it just, it was a poignant reminder to me too, that yes, there's a lot of debate in the world, but when you go there, it, it's, there's so much peace in just being able to trust what these people say in a world where it's, it's kind of hard to trust influencers and stuff because they have their own agendas and things and, and the world kind of puts them on a pedestal. But then you come to conference and you hear the word of God and you can take that away and think, yeah, I'm going to apply this for the next six months and beyond. Um, yeah, um, I would love to get your thoughts on this quote from Elder Bednar too. During a recent open house, open house and media day for a new house of the Lord, I led a group of journalists on a tour through the sacred structure. I described the purposes of temples in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and responded to their many excellent questions. Before entering the celestial room, I explained that this particular room in the house of the Lord symbolically represents the peace and beauty of the heavenly home to which we can return after this life. I indicated to our guests that we would not speak while in the celestial room, but I would be happy to answer any questions after we move to the next stop on the tour. After exiting the celestial room and as we gathered at the next location, I asked our guests if they had any observations they wanted to share. One of the journalists said with great emotion, I have never experienced anything like that in my life. I did not know quiet like that existed in the world. I simply did not believe such stillness was possible. I was struck by both the sincerity and the starkness of this person's statement. And the journalist's reaction highlighted one important aspect of stillness overcoming and tuning out the commotion of our external environment. <clears throat> As I later pondered the journalist's comment and reflected on the often hectic pace of our modern lives, the busyness, noise, diversions, distractions, and detours, 
that so often seem to demand our attention, a scripture came to my mind, be still and know that I am God. I pray the Holy Ghost will enlighten each of us as we consider a higher and holier dimension of stillness in our lives, an inner spiritual stillness of the soul that enables us to know and remember that God is our Heavenly Father, we are His children, and Jesus Christ is our Savior. Um, love to quote that, but <laughs> good story. I'd love to hear your reflections on that, I, what I thought was a really profound theme of this talk being still yeah to me it, it, he was one of the first speakers if not the first speaker and uh, to me it set the tone for the conference because next to the obvious topics the underlying flow of thought was if you choose God if you choose Christ if you choose to follow the, to the gospel you will have peace you will have comfort despite everything that's going on and they acknowledge life is tough and you have to make choice and there are difficulties uh, and, and challenges as part of this wonderful plan that the Heavenly Father has made for us. But if you choose uh, the gospel, you will have that stillness, you will have that comfort and that, and that peace. Uh, and uh, for me, that was really uh, rather it, a few years back, general conferences were really about what we had to do and what we had to prepare and what we had to be mindful of. And this time it really felt more like, okay, we love you, we're here for you, and the gospel is there to uplift you and to help you see th things through in this life. Uh, it was a, a lot more comforting that uh, to me, um, especially again, to recognizing the words that uh, Elder Holland said as well, so personal and so uh, saying, okay, this is urgent, but it's for the right reasons. It is there to support you, to sustain you. Um, to me, that was a, a, a thread that went through the conference this time. Mm -hmm. And given your unique perspectives here, we're gathered today in Amsterdam. Uh, and what I've been inspired by is the, the Dutch honesty and, and the diligence in the gospel. Um, and when you do have these kind of challenges that exist in a church where you're more scarcely spread or that you have to take up um, more of a burden of responsibility. How do you achieve what um, Elder Bednar is, is saying and, and, you know, what motivates you to be able to stay true and honest to your testimony while you are um, sacrificing for the, for the church and the kingdom of God? Love for Jesus Christ. It's just, that's all there is. That's my motivation, my relationship with him. And I think personally, because I have moved so often in my life, there's one constant thing that has been everywhere I've been, and that was God, Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ. Um, and so I've learned to, to trust on them and depend on them. So every day I get up, and I do work for them. And then it doesn't matter how hard it gets, then uh, I will continue because that's the only thing that's worth, the only worth, yeah. And I'd say it's the only worthy thing out there is to just keep, keep going. The work done. Thank you. I think both the quote and the question you asked uh, remind me of the scripture the scripture that says stand ye in holy places um, of course the temple is a holy place it's a sacred place and we can feel peace and uh, it's very still there as we learn from the journalist but I think we should also make our homes uh, holy and safe places where when we get home from work or from just the busyness of life we come home, we can reflect, and we can be still. We can kind of regenerate some, some spiritual energy that we lost that day. And so we can be ready the next day to go out and battle again. And I think that what you shared reminded me of that scripture that we know in places. Thank you. Yeah. Great point. And for me, it's really difficult uh, 
like I have ADHD because my brain is constantly working. It's constantly racing and turning. And uh, but I hear people say, oh, you just need to be quiet. And she says, like, okay, <laughs> that's, that's really <laughs> work for me that way. Um, but uh, I really loved that someone else, I can't remember who it was, but it was during the uh, Saturday evening session. Um, uh, I believe uh, one of the 70 talked about uh, our private times that we need to, um, I can't remember what the word is. Um, saying protect, yeah, yeah protect, protect Elder Bangington. Yes, yeah, from his the father. Yeah, yes, so. yes, that his father had told him to to yeah. protect your uh, private times in life. And I feel like uh, for me, that's how I uh, take those moments. And it's not necessarily by being still because I just it just doesn't work for me. Uh, but by using those private times uh, to do things that can help me stay focused on God and my, my Heavenly Father and of Jesus Christ and His atonement and what that means for me. Uh, for example, one of the things that I uh, started doing a year ago is I changed my alarm uh, to uh, my FSY music playlist. Um, and like no one likes to wake up, or at least I don't like to wake up in the morning. <laughs> but by just waking up with that music in mind, it already starts off my day a certain way, I'm in a certain mindset. Uh, and usually when I then leave to either go to school or to work, uh, I don't change the playlist because I'm just too lazy. Uh, I just plop in my earbuds and then I just turn on the music and then it's that same playlist that I'm constantly reminded uh, of Jesus Christ and his atonement. Uh, and that's something that really works for me personally instead of just trying to sit still and listen because that doesn't doesn't work for me so i found another way to to fill up that space but yeah that's a that's a beautiful way of protecting your private time and giving it to the lord like you you're not you're not sacrificing a, a ton of stuff but you're implementing it into your yes. routine and bringing jesus into your life Letting God prevail, like that's one of the famous quotes. I, I haven't really thought of that, like the the joining of those two talks, but they actually go really hand in hand. Um, you know, how do you be still with so much external influence? Life has become so complex, so busy, so demanding from everywhere. Um, and then using, you know, applying that other talk by Elder Bangta to kind of provide an antidote to that is really beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um Finally, <laughs> got to talk about President Nelson's talk. It's sort of the, the cherry on the top. Um, his quote, my dear, dear brothers, brothers and sisters, sisters, here is my promise. Nothing will help you more to hold fast to the iron rod than worshipping in the temple as regularly as your circumstances permit. Nothing will protect you more as you encounter the world's mists of darkness. Nothing will bolster your testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and his atonement or help you understand God's magnificent plan more. Nothing will soothe your spirit more during times of pain. Nothing will open the heavens more. Nothing. The temple is the gateway to the greatest blessings God has in store for each of us. For the temple is the only place on earth where we may receive all of the blessings promised to Abraham. That is why we are doing all within our power under the direction of the Lord to make the temple blessings more accessible to members of the church. I would love to hear your thoughts as we kind of close this discussion on President Nelson's talk at the end of that conference and, you know, specifically that quote, what he talked about. Yeah, I really love the fact that he kind of reminds us, like, at the end, 
okay, what's the most important thing for us to be doing right now? Uh, and that is truly to keep our covenants, like stay focused on our covenants, because that's where we actually get the power from uh, to be able to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think I, and yeah, for me, that was just like the reminder, I needed to find, okay, this is what I need to do. And if I actually want to go back to my heavenly father, then I need, like, I can only do that with his strength and uh, if I want that strength, then I need to be keeping my confidence. I need to go to the temple. I need to be active, um, actively doing and searching for those things in my life. If you recognize uh, President Nelson as a, the mouthpiece of our Savior and our Heavenly Father, uh, you can appreciate the love that comes from either the warnings or the directions that he gives. Now, first he warns us, say, you cannot survive in these days if you don't have the Spirit with you. And then he tells us to focus on Christ in everything we do. From there on, he goes on to say, please think celestial. And now he says, do everything you can to be in the temple because it protects us. It is that protection that we need to have the spirit in our life, to be focused on Christ and to really have that celestial uh, mindset uh, in, within us. Uh, and uh, it, it's just constantly just... Um, what we recognize in Elder Holland's talk, this sincerity and this urgency, uh, it, it's in most of uh, President Nelson's talks as well, just lovingly inviting us, but it's also saying, please, this is so, so urgent, so, so much needed. And uh, we really want to help you follow Christ and um, do well in, in your life because of the choices that you can make. Um, so for me, that was, uh, yeah. And very obvious. I I have to admit, when he was called as president, I I didn't really know him, and I wasn't really uh, warm to him. But over the years, I've really warmed to him, and I can see now really that he he does everything in his power, everything that he can do to protect Heavenly Father's children and to help as many of them to come home to our Heavenly Father. That the amount of temples that have, have been uh, announced, dedicated, and built is is phenomenal and then it's all literally preparing us for the second coming and preparing us to be ready to uh, be recognized by our heavenly father uh, jesus christ yeah, like... yeah i found it i found it quite hard to watch actually because he he looked very different the last time we saw him he looked quite frail and it, it it felt like it was giving him a quite a lot of effort to give his message, but that makes the message even more special that he still wanted to give his message, you know. Um, and actually, if you if you take the whole conference, all the talks together from all the messages and the themes and then him closing, it just was so powerful, really, about what we need to be doing. And I really feel like they were telling us that there's hard times coming and we need to double down. And um, I think there was one, one there was one mention in one of the talks about once you make covenants, you're not on neutral ground anymore. You know, you, you're in, and then you hold fast. Um, yeah, I just thought it was incredibly powerful. And I kind of want to mention as well um, one talk we didn't mention that was I think it was the very second one of the, of the first session from the Relief Society first counsellor. Yeah. yeah, and she talked about temple clothing and just talked about the garments and I don't think that's ever happened before I've never yeah. heard yeah. such an open public yeah. discussion on that it obviously Preston Oaks as well that yeah was, was a few mentions of it yeah it? exactly and it but it all fits with the theme of of covenants but it was all really explained so well like it's a protection and it's going to give you that armor and it's going to you know clothe you in Jesus Christ and and it was quite mind blowing. So I, I I thought that was incredibly powerful. If you've put all that together and then and then listen to the prophet at the end, it's like everything's pointing towards the temple. Um and yeah, I'm just I'm you know, so I'm grateful that I I can go to the temple regularly. I'm very grateful for that. And I think it's fantastic that the building program's there. Um and it is such a place of peace. So yeah, it was is quite amazing words. And I love listening to him. I mean, however frail he is, he's got those eyes of blue steel 
that just pierce you you know they go into your soul and i just it's for me it's always incredibly powerful thank you absolutely Any more thoughts, reflection on President Nelson's talk? Uh, something very quick. I just loved how he said, as your circumstances permit, he said it earlier today, that there's no standard of going to the temple. Right? Everyone's life is different. Um, salvation is an individual matter, and it doesn't mean that you should go to the temple every week or every month, but really, as your circumstances allow. Mm-hmm. And that's what you do it, but put God first, and we... Uh, look for every opportunity to go to the temple and we can put on that armor and that protection uh, and I think that's really important uh, there's not a, a set standard but that everyone can kind of interpret it for, their, for themselves absolutely yeah it was uh, it was amazing also to hear him talk I thought the Kirtland Temple would have been mentioned more uh, throughout the talks uh, and then obviously we addressed to that and it just seemed like a really nice crescendo Every, everything seemed unified uh, to that higher goal topped with President Nelson's message so uh, yeah it's well it's been an absolute honour to visit with you all today and learn from you and hear your insights reflections about the general conference uh, I've absolutely loved it it's been my highlight of Amsterdam uh, and I had a Stroop waffle that was expensive so it must have been good <laughs> But before we close, any, any final reflections, thoughts uh, before we finish? Last words of the episode. Um, well, you'll have to come back sometime and see some more around, more of the Netherlands. Yes, I, I want to get out of Amsterdam and, and go around it. It would yeah. be great. I need to see the tulips. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next month. Next month. Is that when, it, yeah. uh, when they properly get into bloom? Yeah. That's good. Well, well, it's very easy to get here. So, <laughs> UK. I'm not sure where we'll go in October. Someone messaged and said, "Come to the Middle East," and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> <We'll> save, <laughs> yeah, start saving up our pennies. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for for your effort in coming and uh, being willing to share. It's been an absolute honour and something I'll remember for a long time. So, thank you all. Thank you for having us. And okay. thank you for listening and share your reflections below in the comments and all of that (laughs) but uh thank you and goodbye for now thanks for watching for all the saints this show needs your help to grow please like the video comment your thoughts subscribe to the channel and share this with someone you think would enjoy it thank you